from the Digital Media Center on the campus of Southern Oregon University in Ashland, Oregon. This is Ramping Up Your English, an educational program for intermediate level English language learners. Here's your host for Ramping Up Your English, John Letts. Welcome to Ramping Up Your English, winner of the Southern Oregon Television Award for Best Program and the Award for Best Educational Program. I'm the host and producer, John Letts. Ramping Up Your English is an educational support program for intermediate English learners. It's a program for people from all language backgrounds. Ramping Up Your English is also for people of all ages. If you've already passed the beginning stages of learning English and want a higher level of proficiency, this program is designed to meet your needs. We take a content-based approach to helping you reach higher levels of English proficiency. Our current thematic unit is Animals. This is segment one of episode 44. Our learning about animals will ramp up the proficiency level while working on this academic science unit. In order to research and report on an animal, we'll need to use a number of language functions and connecting words that we can transfer to other subject matter. For consistency, we'll repeatedly use information from wildlife cards like this one. In this episode, our focus is on describing an animal. Now, many people don't have to think twice when asked to describe something, but I've seen eyes glaze over when one of my students was told to describe. Just what does it mean to describe? In the simplest terms, describing an object is to use a set of words that will form a picture in the mind of someone who hears or reads our description. Size, shape, color, features, all these other details are brought into play when it comes to inspiring that mental picture. In this episode, we'll start with a wild animal that's likely to be known by most viewers. We'll start with deer. Now, the English word deer is used for both singular and plural applications. One deer is called a deer, and several of them are also called deer. I saw one deer, my sister saw three deer. Let's watch a video clip about deer and their kin. Here in the Pacific Northwest, we're blessed with these wild animals black-tailed deer. Okay, these fawns don't look very wild, and there's certainly nothing ferocious about them. But these forest-edge dwellers don't depend on humans for food, water, shelter, or space. And while not aggressive with man or beast, you don't want to come between a doe and her fawns. These slender legs can kick with quite a punch. Deer spend most of their time eating, and their diet is pretty extensive. Grass, leaves, stems, flowers, moss, and lichens, to name just a few items on their menu. Whether reaching up or down, Deer are plant eaters. They graze. They don't hunt. When they're not prey to cougars or wolves, deer seem to get along with all the animals of the forest. These wild turkeys seem to go unnoticed by these deer, too busy grazing to react to their presence. Black-tailed deer thrive at the edge of the forest, where the forest meets an opening. Now this has led some to claim this as a reason to cut down trees. But that's a half-baked idea. 
the forest is still just as essential as the opening. Now the turkeys get close enough to merit a glance from this doe. The word doe is used for a mature female deer. Does are often seen with other does. They seem to tolerate each other's presence without any problems. A male deer is called a buck. Bucks have antlers like this young buck. The age of a buck can be seen by the number of points on its antlers. An immature deer is called a fawn, recognized by the white spots that helps them blend into the forest. This deer is at Crater Lake National Park, Oregon's only national park. They come up here to this elevation in the summer. They'll move to lower country in the winter. During that season, the area you see them in now is deeply covered in snow. Deer give as well as receive nutrition. The antlers shed by bucks supply calcium to other animals. Meet another member of the deer family. These large ungulates are called elk, and these are females. Female elk are called cows. They often gather with other females. Elk are easily identified by their size, much larger than black-tailed deer, and their white rumps. A male elk is called a bull, and only the bulls grow antlers. A bull elk can mate with a number of cows. This bull was the only male in the area with nine cows nearby. This is known as the bull's harem. This bull seems quite content with the situation. In contrast to the small families in which deer live, elk form large herds. These Roosevelt elk live near Reedsport, Oregon. These bulls are wearing the extensive antlers that only the bulls grow. The antlers are covered by a living layer of soft material called felt. This felt will be removed by the elk themselves when the time is right. They'll rub their antlers against objects like trees and against the antlers of other elk. In the wild, Roosevelt elk rarely live beyond 12 to 15 years but in captivity they've been known to live over 25 years. Roosevelt elk have a special claim to fame in the conservation movement. Olympic National Park in Washington was set aside largely to provide habitat for Roosevelt elk. Only one bull in this herd is allowed to mate with the cows and this is that bull. Unless challenged, this bull will have his genes passed on to all the offspring that occurs in this herd. Bulls establish and maintain their dominance through bugling and posturing. The bugle is a high-pitched vocalization. Non-dominant males have their role in the elk herd, including protecting the group. Now this male hears or sees something at this tree line. Here's his reaction. Between digging in his antlers and flying urine, he's showing that he won't hesitate to fight to protect the herd. With that drama behind him, he gets back to other pressing matters, scratching an itch with his antlers and grazing on the grass. He gives the aerial one last glance, then he resumes his grazing. Finally, he settles down with the other non-dominant males. With dominance settled for the time being, the males get along fine with each other. The cows get along too, settling apart from the males. Notice how these animals are different from elk. 
Notice the shape of the antlers. These are forest caribou in Denali National Park in Alaska. They are in the same family as deer and elk. All mature caribou grow antlers, male and female. Now, these caribou are hanging out in the last spots of snow that remain from winter. The snow cools them and helps them escape the relentless attack of mosquitoes. All members of the deer family have adapted to survive in the habitats they occupy. Conserving those habitats is essential work if we're to continue being blessed by their presence. Welcome back to Ramping Up Your English. This is segment two of episode 44. Do you recognize what this is? This is an antler from a deer. A deer buck would have two of these, one for each side of its head. Now, we're focusing on deer in this episode, a wild animal that's likely to be known by viewers. We're using English to describe an animal. That animal is a deer. Now, I used to tell students to describe an animal as if describing it to an alien. And I came to realize I was withholding a powerful tool, that of using a familiar animal as a starting point when possible. Now, thinking of farm animals, several possibilities emerge in describing a deer. A Jersey cow has those long skinny legs compared to the body. Another candidate is a dog. Now, either one could be a beginning point as long as we're willing to then say how a deer is different from the familiar animal. Let's go ahead and use a dog as a starting point. We could write that a deer looks similar to a large dog, only it's larger than the largest dog. The legs are longer in comparison to the size of its core body. Looking at the tail, it's much shorter than the tail of most dogs. Now as for the head, it's more narrow than the head of most dogs, and the snout is longer. The ears of a deer are much larger than those of a dog, and they're erect, never floppy. The pointed tips are usually straight up, but sometimes pulled back. A deer's eyes are oval in shape, and the neck is long between its head and main body. Now remember that we're trying to create a picture in the mind's eye of the listener or the reader. We could include and should include, as a matter of fact, color, the light to medium brown of a deer's coat on a mature doe. As for the buck, we should mention that it's larger and more muscular than a doe and that it has antlers. It's worth mentioning that the fawn has those white spots on its coat. Now, black-tailed deer, like the deer in the video clip, have short black tails with white underneath and at the tip. Some people think in terms of weight, height, and length, these should all go into a description, but not until the more visual aspects. Now, let's look at some of the connecting words we use in the description. We use the word similar to to make it clear uh, we went, did that to make it clear that the deer don't look exactly like a large dog, okay? Then we use the word only to indicate how it's different from a dog, only it's larger than a dog. We use the comparative form of long, longer, in the words in, in comparing, see a comparison to showing we're referring to the ratio between the leg length and the size of the torso, so we use longer. For the tail, we wrote much shorter than to show the difference from most dogs. We also had to use most because some dogs have very short tails. Now, for comparing the head that of that of most dogs, we also use the word, we use the words more narrow than for comparing. And again, we use the words for most dogs, since greyhounds, for example, have extremely narrow heads. Now, for the ears, we use the words much larger than, which is clearly the case, and an easy distinction to see. The oval eyes are obvious, as is the long neck connecting the head to the torso. Since we established a pattern using the word than, we can just write longer. 
We made repeated use of comparatives, adding ER to the descriptive word, the adjective. That forms the comparative. Now notice the difference with the adjective narrow. It uses an alternative form for forming the comparative. The word more in front of it works better with some words, and narrow is a good example. So is pointed. So let's look at this video clip while reading the description and try to spot what we need to add to it so we have a more clear description of a black-tailed deer. So we're seeing the same clip we just saw. A black-tailed deer looks similar to a large dog, only it's larger than the largest dog. The legs are longer in comparison to the size of its core body. Looking at its tail, it's much shorter than the tail of most dogs. Now as for the head, it's more narrow than the head of most dogs and the snout is longer. The ears are much larger and they're erect, never floppy. The pointed tips are more pointed than most dogs. A deer's eyes are slightly oval in shape and the neck is longer between its head and main body. Now this is a rough description that can certainly be refined, but it's a good start. Now let's take a look at that while I read it again. So we're gonna go back to this description and it says the black-tailed deer looks similar to a large dog, only it's larger than the largest dog. The legs are longer in comparison to the size of its core body, Looking at its tail, it's much shorter than the tail of most dogs. Now as for the head, it's more narrow than the head of most dogs and the snout is longer. The ears are much larger and they're erect, never floppy. The pointed tips are more pointed than most dogs. A deer's eyes are slightly oval in shape and the neck is longer between the head and main body. Now, I saw a few things in the video clip that could be added to the description. The front legs are shorter than the back legs. In describing animals, we have a special name for front and back. The front legs are called forelegs and the back, log, the back legs are called hind legs. So things that are near the head are called fore, that's F-O-R-E, not F-O-U-R as in the number after three. Now, things near the tail are called hind. The rump of an animal, the part near the tail, is called the hind quarters. Now, another observation is that the back legs are slightly bent at the knees. Notice that we're no longer comparing the deer to dogs. We're just reporting what we see. Another feature is that a deer's feet are hooved, meaning they have that hard cloven feet that are actually a form of toenails. Now, how about the color markings other than the tail? Did you see the dark shade on the ears or the black nose? How about the lighter colored belly? You see, you can put all these details into a description that will help the listener or reader picture what the animal looks like. Notice I did not include what any of these physical features do for the deer. We save that for a part of the report on adaptations. We'll take a look at another wild animal to describe as your homework. We'll do that right after this. Little organization that's doing big time restoration of forests and stream banks. Hello, I'm John Lett. Welcome back to Ramping Up Your English. We're helping intermediate level English learners improve their English. This is segment three of episode 44. Our focus today is on describing an animal for a report. Now, um, if you haven't already done so, be sure to obtain a notebook and dedicate it to this unit on animals. As we demonstrate the patterns used to report on an animal, You'll want to keep those in your notebook as well as the research you find when reporting on an animal of your choice. We're presenting a lot of material and you'll want to 
access it later. So a notebook like this might be just the thing to have. Now, rem are you ready for your homework assignment? Well, watch this video and then practice describing the animal seen there. Black bears. You want to see one in the wild, yet not on the trail you're hiking. They are North America's most numerous species of bear and the most widely distributed, found from Alaska to Louisiana, Oregon to Vermont. Just their paw print can engender a sense of wonder and caution. Black bears hibernate, but only in certain areas. You may find a sleeping bear in a cave or at the base of an overturned tree. They use very little energy while hibernating, but in warmer climates, black bears skip the winter nap. They stay active all year. This black bear is in Alaska, where it surely hibernated through the harsh winter. It looks like it used all its fat and then some, now munching on some grass after hibernation. Its hunger brought it to the edge of the water, but sight of our boat had it returned to the safety of the forest. These first graders are giving hints so their classmate can guess the animal in the picture behind her head. It's a brown and it's big. Big and brown, good. Is this? It, it has its um, uh, It has little, little and big hands. Oh, big paws, good. Angelica, you're raising your hand quietly again. It has a lot of fur. Lots of fur. It eats honey. Oh, that's a good hint. Do you have any guesses? Yeah. What? Bear. Um, bear. Good, you get a point. From the safety of a boat, I videotaped these bear cubs exploring the coastline in Alaska. Mama bears are notoriously protective of their young, but these cubs were allowed to romp freely. Hey, tell me about the black bear's adaptations. American black bears have flat teeth so they can grind plants. They have um, carved claws so they can um, protect their young and get grab food. They have black fur so they can blend in. American black bear hibernate during the winter. And you know don't forget can... about the bear. And, they have and the, the bear. The mouse. The bear, the mammal? <laughs> yeah. Oh. <laughs> That's you already take that. Hey, the, the bear, bear are on the whale. Like the whale small. is like a huge, it's like a, like mm, a huge mammal. Bears can be dangerous, especially when cubs are around. Hi. My name is Melanie Hurtado, and I'm going to say something special of my American black bear. American black bears, in the winter, they hibernate, and it goes up about 31 pounds, and it stays without soil and water. This black bear seems to be stalking these buffalo. A fence separates the bear from the bison. This black bear is about to receive a meal from children attending summer camp at Wildlife Images. They spent the morning assembling food that's healthy for the black bears and several other animals as well at this Wildlife Rehabilitation and Education Center. One in there, which is fine. It's just produce. It's right there. And I think we had a whole bunch of crumbs somewhere that she said we could have. Um. Black bears are unpredictable. While hiking in the forest of southern Oregon, I've heard and spotted black bears running away from me. More often, I've seen the tracks on the trail, the tracks left by the paws of the bears, but the bears, they stayed out of sight. Rarely, bear encounters turn out differently. The most dangerous is when hikers come across a female bear with her cub. The mama bear sees the human as a predator and will suddenly attack. A friend of mine was hiking on a canyon trail along the Rogue River and met a bear when coming around a blind bend in the trail. 
After a tense standoff, the bear began a charge, but then ran off the trail, leaving my friend a bit shaken. These black bears were taken to wildlife images because they had been traumatized or injured. No longer able to survive in the wild, they are now a part of Wildlife Images Education Program. The summer campers throw the nutritious food safely over the electric fencing to the black bears. Preparing this food has taught them about the nutritional needs of these animals. Bye, beer. Welcome back to Ramping Up Your English. This is episode 44, Describing an Animal. It's our first step in reporting on an animal. Our homework is to use the video clip you just saw to describe what black bears look like. Now, this is a chance at independent practice. Feel free to repeat the instructional part of this episode, or even the whole episode, as many times as you want. Listen for information on how to access our website, for links to the video clips and the instructional content contained in this episode. We'll review what your homework assignment may look like when we have episode 46. Along with your homework, you can start reading about animals. This book from National Geographic is entitled Animals in Summer, and it has a picture of a fawn on the cover. Look for it at the children's section of your local library. We have guidelines for your homework and all the instruction we feature today. Visit letscreate.org. All episodes of Ramping Up Your English are there, as well as links to the video clips we used in today's program. You can watch Ramping Up Your English on channels 15, 15.1, 15 and 115 on the Ashland Home Network, and on channel 182 on Charter Cable in Southern Oregon. Showtimes are 8 a.m. on Mondays and 7.30 p.m. on Thursdays. Now, channels and showtimes will vary in other parts of the country. Contact your local access station to see the schedule in your area. I want to thank Gary Mark Roberts for his video work on the black bear clip featured in today's episode. I'm also grateful to Wildlife Images for allowing me to videotape their bears. Wildlife Images is featured on a recent episode of an RV TV program entitled Adventures in Education. I posted a link on my website if you're interested in seeing more about this wildlife rehabilitation and educational organization. It's also available on archive.org on that site. I have to thank, or I don't have to, I want to thank my director, Denise Ross, and my talented crew, and my listeners and viewers. I want to thank all of you. All of you helped to make this program an award winner. Join us next time for Ramping Up Your English. I'm John Letts. You've been watching Ramping Up Your English, a support program for intermediate level English language learners. Learn more. Visit our website at letscreate.org. You can also watch or download today's program at archive.org slash details slash TV. Join us next time on RBTV Voices for Ramping Up Your English.